Well, thank you, Ken. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you and uh, to have this discussion on the nation's strategic posture. Um, this discussion is important and timely. Uh, later today, administration officials will brief members of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee on the status of the nuclear posture review. I would like to start by thanking the Hudson Institute for hosting this event, and I would also like to thank the expert panelists uh, for sharing their insights today. Uh, I commit Hudson for fostering a thoughtful dialogue on a complex issue and for bringing together strategic thinkers who represent a diversity of views. Um, I think we should all wish for a world that is without nuclear weapons, as President Obama declared in Prague last April. It's a bold statement. Um, it's one that, that certainly uh, I think we would all wish to have occur. Uh, but I'm a realist. And like Secretary Gates, who worked for three Cold War presidents who each wanted to eliminate nuclear weapons, I believe that as long as others have nuclear weapons and the know-how to make them, so must we. As Secretary Gates said, quote, we must maintain some level of these weapons ourselves to deter potential adversaries and to reassure over two dozen allies and partners who rely on our nuclear umbrella for their security, making it necessary for them to develop their own. Decisions about our nuclear policy, posture, and any arms control outcomes must reflect this reality. I am deeply concerned that a U.S. policy centered on the President's desire to go to zero will lead to unwise decisions and unintended consequences, and its, un its allure may be a distraction from the near-term nuclear security and proliferation challenges facing our nation and the international community. For starters, we must continue to hear um, we continue to hear that deep force reductions are being considered for the START follow-on treaty in the Nuclear Posture Review. The joint understanding on START signed by Presidents Obama and Medvedev in July commits both countries to reducing their number of strategic delivery vehicles to a range of between 500 and, one, and 1,100 and associated warheads to a range of between 1,500 and 1,675. On July 30th, during a House Armed Services Committee hearing, Assistant Secretary of State Philip Gordon testified that, quote, the basic belief is that we can certainly maintain our deterrent adequately, even at lower numbers in the ranges of 500 delivery vehicles and 1,500 warheads, close quote. Well, I have several questions. First, what is driving these deep reductions? Specifically, what has changed to justify these lower numbers? Is it a change in policy? targeting, threats, or some other factor. With the Nuclear Posture Review not yet complete, I would question the determination that 500 strategic delivery vehicles and 1,500 warheads are adequate to fulfill our nation's deterrent objectives. Furthermore, administration officials have suggested that the reductions in START are merely round one. A round two of further reductions are being considered in the NPR. Without a clear understanding of the administration's nuclear policy and strategy changes, why those changes are being made and the resulting nuclear force structure, there appears to be little justification for these reductions other than perhaps the President's desire to go to zero. I would like to see policy and strategy drive numbers and not the other way around. Second, what is the future of our nuclear triad of ICBMs, SLBMs, and bombers? Will we see policy changes and force reductions that impact one or more legs of the nuclear triad? Given that our ICBMs alone constitute 450 strategic delivery vehicles, an overall cap at 500 may very well lead to the elimination of at least one, of our, one leg of our nuclear triad. The Bipartisan Congressional Commission on the Strategic Posture of the United States, led by Drs. Perry and Schlesinger, unanimously believe that Quote, the triad of strategic nuclear delivery systems should be maintained, and each leg of the nuclear triad provides unique contributions to stability. I agree, and would find any policy decision that puts a nuclear triad at risk unacceptable. Third, will the administration's nuclear policy address modernization? Earlier this year, the commander of U.S. Strategic Command testified, quote, the most urgent concerns for today's nuclear enterprise lie with our aging stockpile, infrastructure, and human capital. Assuming we want to maintain a credible and effective nuclear deterrent, how can we support a smaller stockpile without also supporting efforts to increase stockpile reliability? 
Secretary Gates stated last October, October, quote, to be blunt, there is absolutely no way we can maintain a credible deterrent and reduce the number of weapons in our stockpile without either resorting to testing our stockpile or pursuing a modernization program. The Strategic Commission also found that, quote, the United States could reduce its reliance on and thus supply of reserve warheads if it were to refurbish the nuclear infrastructure. I have made it clear that I will not support the implementation of further arms reductions without a modernization plan. Finally, will the reduction in nuclear forces lead to a greater role for missile defenses and other conventional forces? Can capabilities such as conventional prop global, global strike substitute for nuclear forces in holding certain targets at risk? If so, it is quite troubling that the administration not only appears to be considering limitations on missile defenses and conventional forces as part of START, but has willingly conceded to Russian demands by abandoning the Polish and Czech-based European missile defense proposal without demanding any equivalent action by Moscow. I wrote to the President last March, if Russia perceives it can gain U.S. concessions on missile defense now, it will be more likely to demand greater concessions later. True to form, last week a top Russian general criticized U.S. conventional prop prompt global strike plans. I felt that it was important for Congress to address these concerns. Though an amendment I introduced to the National Defense Authorization Act was modified, the end result retains my intent and clearly states the position of Congress on starred nuclear force reductions. It says, quote, it is the sense of Congress that one, the President should maintain the stated position of the United States that the follow-on treaty to the START treaty not include any limitations on the ballistic missile defense systems, space capabilities, or advanced conventional weapon systems of the United States. Two, the enhanced safety, security, and reliability of the nuclear weapons stockpile, modernization of the nuclear weapons complex, and maintenance of the nuclear delivery systems are key to enabling further reductions in the nuclear forces of the United States. And three, the President should submit budget requests for fiscal year 2011 and subsequent fiscal years for the programs of the National Nuclear Security Administration of the Department of Energy that are adequate to sustain the needed capabilities to support the long-term maintenance of the nuclear stockpile of the United States. As I said earlier, I am concerned that the administration's policy and posture decisions might also produce several unintended consequences. A credible extended deterrent can support our non-proliferation objectives by reducing the incentives for our allies to develop their own nuclear arsenals. In the area of deterrence, perceptions matter. Should the credibility of our extended deterrence erode, whether by deep reductions or specific warhead retirements, would our allies pursue their own nuclear weapons capability? The Strategic Commission underscored the importance of extended deterrence to the security of our allies and concluded that, quote, the U.S. nuclear force posture should not be redesigned without substantive and high-level consultation with U.S. allies in both Europe and Asia. Given the administration's emphasis on international engagement, it is important for them to consult with our allies as they contemplate nuclear force reductions and shifts in policy. In the wake of the administration's poor handling of its recent European missile defense announcement, consultation with allies on decisions that may affect U.S. assurances and security commitments will be essential. The Strategic Commission also highlighted the outstanding security challenges posed by Russia's overwhelming number of nuclear tactical weapons. The separation of strategic and tactical wep nuclear weapons is specious. From the viewpoint of Turkey, Poland, or France, a Russian tactical nuclear weapon looks strategic. If the intent of arms control is to increase security and stability, then Russia's tactical nuclear weapons must be on the table for negotiation. We would not want to see Russia use its advantage in tactical nuclear forces as a cover to coerce its European and Central Asian neighbors. And these neighbors are concerned. On July 15th, 22 prominent Central and Eastern European figures wrote to the President an open letter expressing deep concerns about their security and the transatlantic relationship. They wrote, quote, we welcome the reset of the American-Russian relations, but there is also nervousness in our capitals. We want to ensure that, we want to ensure that too narrow an understanding of Western interests does not lead to the wrong concessions to Russia. Should Russia's tactical nuclear weapons not be addressed, 
then U.S. reassurance and continued commitment to extended deterrence becomes more significant. Another consequence to consider is one of unintended competition. China is steadily increasing its strategic inventory, which is currently estimated at approximately 400 nuclear weapons, according to data presented to the Strategic Commission's final report. We must be mindful that there may be a level at which U.S. and Russia nuclear reductions will be low enough to incentivize China to build up its nuclear arsenal to achieve parity or even beyond. Finally, I ask that we consider the impact of force reductions on our own targeting policy. Today, our nuclear forces are adequate to fulfill a counterforce deterrence policy, by which I mean a policy that is based on targeting a potential adversary's military infrastructure. However, as we decrease our nuclear force levels, there may be a point at which our lower inventory levels would drive us to a counter value policy, namely targeting a potential adversary's cities and civilian populations in order to achieve deterrence. This would be a substantial change from our current policy and a debate that I'm not sure that the American public is ready for. As French President Nicolas Sarkozy said the day before revealing Iran's covert uranium enrichment facility at GOM, we live in a real world, not a virtual world. The Strategic Commission concluded, quote, the conditions that might make possible the global elimination of nuclear weapons are not present today, and their creation would require a fundamental transformation of the world political order. So the reality is that for the seeable future, the U.S. must retain a credible and effective nuclear deterrent that is safe, secure, and reliable. Our allies will continue to rely on U.S. extended deterrence commitments, and Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, and others will continue to pose considerable nuclear security challenges. Any changes to U.S. nuclear policy and posture must account for these realities. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate uh, your focus.